Saturday Matters. Well, we're going to wake up our brains with interesting stuff provided by our fellow residents. And this is part two of three of a neighborhood uh, a lot of us are very familiar with. And in fact, I grew up in. And um, these are some of the major influences on what happened. Uh, so Fred has some really, really great photographs, too. I've seen them. So let's, let's get started, Fred. All right. <clears throat> Very good. But uh, before we get started, I, I want to uh, respond to one of the questions that was asked at the end of the first, uh, yes. Uh, everybody, if you haven't turned off your yeah. cell phones, please do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Henry had asked a question about uh, the uh, streetcars and wanted to know how they were powered. Well, I, I told him I would, uh, I would get an answer because I wasn't sure. Uh, but uh, they started out in 1884 with streetcars that uh, the uh, uh, transit innovator Frank Osgood uh, ran down 2nd Avenue. They were pulled by horses. <laughs> Obviously, pulling uh, a uh, streetcar with a horse wasn't going to work very well in a, a city as hilly as uh, Seattle. So they started looking at other things, and, uh, and another group of people decided that they would try the cable cars. And so they started pulling uh, the uh, uh, streetcars with uh, uh, cables under the ground. Well, it was at about this time that uh, in uh, Virginia, they had uh, uh, discovered uh, a way of using electric uh, uh, streetcars. <coughs> and uh, so they quickly here got on to uh, putting in some of the uh, electric uh, uh, lines and uh, being able to pull the, the streetcars. So the, it, this is a picture of a streetcar. If you were looking uh, uh, south on uh, uh, I think it's on University Way from 45th Northeast, and uh, this this was one in about 1909. The interesting thing is that in just three years after testing the first electric streetcar, Seattle had almost 50 miles of streetcar track plus 22 miles of cable. So they, Seattle was. Uh, was increasing in population very rapidly. Uh, they had the need of being able to move people around and they were quickly uh, developing a system that was going to allow that to happen. Now in the first talk, uh, I spoke about the, the rather shaky start that the university had when it was uh, the uh, uh, Territorial University of Washington. Uh, they had to close their doors on five different occasions because they simply didn't have the money to stay open. Then I reviewed the critical role paid, played by Professor Edmund Meany after the, the <coughs> statehood had occurred. Edmund Meany went down to uh, position himself in the state legislature. And he got the, uh, the legislator to, legislature to uh, fund the University of Washington. And he got them to agree to move the university from downtown Seattle out to Interlochen. That is the space between Lake Union and Lake Washington. Uh, and he got them to fund the first uh, building, which, uh, as we saw last time, was Denny Hall. Now, second in importance to the university district, to the coming of the university, that would be the first thing that was important. Uh, the second was the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. So I want to tell you a little bit about what the Alaska Yukon Pacific Ex Exposition is all about. The original idea for this came from a group of people who 
had participated in the Klondike Gold Rush. And they thought in about 1905 that they thought it would be great in 1907 uh, to, to have uh, this celebration because it, it would have been the 10th anniversary of the Klondike Gold Rush. Well, as it turned out, the Chamber of Commerce didn't feel like that was going to be able to work well in, in uh, 1907 because at the same time, there was in Virginia, uh, the Jamestown, Virginia was uh, having a, a, a celebration, their tricentennial celebration, and it was again one of these large fair-like uh, celebrations. And so they didn't want to interfere with that because there were going to be people that would be arriving uh, to the exposition uh, from all over the country, and so they wanted to make certain there wasn't going to be a big uh, conflict here. So they postponed the uh, Alaska-Yukon Pacific Exposition until 1909. But when they did that, they asked for additional funding so that they could expand this. And the purpose of the, they wanted to be able to have Seattle have an opportunity to display the pride in their heritage and in their patriotism. While uh, pl planning for the development of the fair, uh, there were workmen in, in the uh, Seattle Chamber of Commerce uh, that uh, were going to make the decisions about where to uh, locate the, the uh, fair. And who came through again? Professor Edmund Meany. <laughs> he convinced them that the University of Washington campus was the exact spot that they ought to put it. And after some discussion, they agreed to that. So the thing that was important about that is that the exposition brought some new buildings to the campus. Uh, I'll talk more about those later. And it transformed a large area of rough forest. Uh, to an Olmsted Brothers design park-like plan for later use in uh, the, the growing campus. Now let's just think a minute about who the Olmsted Brothers are. This is a firm that designed, among many other things, Central Park in New York, the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, Yosemite Park, the campus of Stanford University, which is beautiful if you've been on it, the Seattle Park Program, that is the exposition, hired a firm that had done some really remarkable things. One of the first things they did was to design a campus in this park-like atmosphere. So where to place the buildings, where to have the entertainment area, uh, which streets ought to be uh, uh, dealt with, and so on. All of that uh, uh, took place <coughs> in the original design. So the groundbreaking ceremonies for the Alaska-Yukon Pacific Exposition started in June of 1907 in the Natural Amphitheater on the campus, which is located roughly where Bedelford Hall now stands. The number of people present that day was estimated from 8,000 to 10,000 people. Clearing the land began. Now appreciate, there, there were no bulldozers in those days. Men and horses. More than a hundred teams of horses. Steam shovels and dynamite did the work. So although the, the funding, was, there was funding that was provided by the state, most of the funding that uh, needed to be uh, uh, provided was by the city of Seattle. And I want to just walk you through some of the things that they had to go through. The first was in the area of uh, parks, 
boulevards, rocks, and plants. So he had a, uh, the Olmsted brothers had, had a uh, plan that provided for boulevards that would go from the downtown Seattle area uh, on over across the hill and up up to where uh, the, uh, uh, the exposition would be held. And uh, they recommended that these be paved. They also recommended that if the city, that any of the streets in the university district that were going to be uh, needed should be paved. The problem was they didn't have a rock crusher. They had to go up uh, to uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Board of Park Commissioners, and they approved uh, $8,333.33 on January 30th, 1908. And that was for uh, the erection of a rock crushing plant on the military reservation at Deception Pass in Skagit County. The city council then approved the rock quarry and appointed uh, and appropriated 30,000 on June 15th. And the mayor signed the order and ordinance on uh, June 30th. The park board also directed the superintendent of parks to provide the exposition with plants and shrubs, as much stock as could be spared. So that was just one department in the city of Seattle already had uh, some costs. The same thing happened in several others. First of all, in the police department. The police were originally going to uh, handle the streets of downtown Seattle and the transportation system that would uh, get people out to the uh, exposition. Uh, but they weren't going to go into the, the exposition site and provide uh, uh, police services there. Their arguments, by the way, they were saying that with this exposition being held in the city, as a result, uh, numbers of the best pickpockets, confidence <laughs> men, and criminals will flock to this city. <laughs> So the exposition grounds would have to be amply protected to make certain, both by uniformed men and detectives, uh, that could handle the kinds of problems that would be coming up. So they went to the mayor and said that, that their plan wasn't good enough, that they needed the police to be on site and in sufficient numbers so that they, they could protect the, uh, the people that were there. And he agreed to provide 75 five uniformed emergency men and asked the exposition to bear the expense of 10 men constituting the detective corps in plain clothes, all under the authority of the chief of police. The lighting and water department needed 21,000 linear feet of cast iron pipe 62 hydrants, seven or eight standpipes, and whatever uh, was not uh, paid for would be removed by the exposition management and returned in good order to the city of Seattle. Again, at some considerable cost. The city also agreed to provide the exposition with Cedar River water at a rate of $15 per million gallons. <laughs> there were also other requests that came in that needed to be handled if this was going to be a successful exposition. The Seattle Federation of Women's Clubs stressed the imperative and urgent importance of additional comfort stations <laughs> restaurants. The <laughs> petition was uh, endorsed by the Board of Public Works. In 1909, uh, April 30, 1909, the Seattle Chamber of Commerce requested that a sufficient sum of money be appropriated with which to construct a welcome arch 
to be located near Fortson Place. And with the mayor's approval, the city council finance committee approved $4,000 appropriation for the project. And that was uh, built, uh, they built an arch at 2nd and Marion in downtown Seattle that was a good welcome to any of the visitors who were staying downtown where most of them would because there weren't many places to stay out in this area. Mm -hmm. One final thing that uh, we will uh, mention here is that the uh, Yukon pioneers who inspired the fair commissioned a statue of William H. Seward, the man who many of the pioneers felt uh, that uh, their adventures uh, had made their adventures in the Yukon possible. Uh, together with the Chamber of Commerce, the pioneers funded the statue, which was created by, uh, in Paris by an American, Richard Brooks. The work was unveiled at the exposition on September 10, 1909. It subsequently became the property of the city of Seattle and currently resides in Volunteer Park. So with that as an, in an introduction as to the kinds of uh, problems that were being addressed in advance of this uh, uh, AYPE, uh, we'll look at some of the pictures that relate to it. <clears throat> okay, this is the entrance. It was at Northeast uh, 40th uh, Street uh, and 15th Avenue. <clears throat> building that I later would have uh, worked in was right up uh, about the, at that location. <laughs> yeah, and the Caledonian was <laughs> across the street. Yes. That was, <laughs> Hadn't been built yet, I guess. Th that was the New Caledonian. Okay. The New Caledonian uh, apartments were uh, uh, one of the buildings that I had an office in for a time until there was a uh, an arsonist that came and lit three fires in the building, and I had to be called out by the uh, uh, provost to come down at three o'clock in the morning to take a look at our building. And uh, uh, we went from being nowhere on the list of needing a new building to being at the top <laughs> of the list. <laughs> and, but the new Caledonian eventually came down. Uh, a little sidelight here, I, I told this to uh, Jerry one time, that uh, the physics department was planning for a new building, and uh, I met regularly with the chairs of the, the uh, physical science uh, departments. And uh, uh, as they were planning for their new building, he came to me and said, do you have the name of the arsonist? <laughs> <laughs> They thought that would assure them a new building. <laughs> okay, let's look at the next picture. This would be the Latona Bridge. Far enough up. There's the Latona Bridge. The reason I wanted to show you this is that that bridge was designed to be able to take the streetcars that uh -huh. were being uh, okay. uh, brought over it so that uh, probably more than a, a million people traveled over that bridge during the, uh, the exposition. So it's, it was an important uh, part of this. Where would it be today? That Where you, would the Latona Bridge be today? That one was torn down and another one was built later on that we could handle. What's it called? I mean, is that any of the bridges that we've got today no. in Seattle? Uh, it, it, I don't think it is, but uh, uh, I, let me get back to you on that. Okay. Okay. Now, most people who had gone to these large fairs or large expositions that they had around the country, and there, there seemed to be quite a number of them that were being uh, held, uh, they probably thought that no affair of this sort could possibly be, com be in a good uh, condition at, at the time. The AYP exposition did just that. 
when President Taft pressed a gold nugget encrusted telegraph key in Washington, D.C. on June 1, 1909. The president then lent his prestige to the fair when he later attended it. Almost 90,000 people visited the fair on the first day. To view the exhibits, enjoy the amusements on Pay Streak. Well, here is Pay Streak being shown up here at the moment. Uh, uh, they had enjoyed a lot of things during that first day that the, the uh, uh, AYP exposition uh, was held. A surprising accomplishment was for the streetcar system to transport about, transport about 70,000 of the visitors. Many people were on the grounds that evening when, predictably, it began to rain. <laughs> Such a stampede to get on the streetcars developed that the crowd demolished a number of refreshment stands between Northeast 40th and Northeast 41st Streets on 15th Avenue Northeast. Women fainted, <laughs> children cried, and some of the passengers paid several fares in an attempt to get on the cable cars or up on the streetcars. In June of 1909, the statue of George Washington by Laredo Taft was unveiled by the Daughters of the American Revolution, and it became, uh, for generations of students at the UW, a, uh, a, a very familiar point. Okay, Portage Bay, and this was, uh, uh, if you uh, can avoid the typo up there, but, uh, this was taken from a tethered balloon that was way up above uh, the uh, uh, exposition. And this was looking at the Portage Bay uh, section of uh, Lake Union. Uh, just kind of an interesting uh, way of gathering uh, information about the area. No ship canal. <coughs> no ship canal at that time. Right. Uh, that'll, we'll hear more about that in a minute. Uh, let's uh, look at the next one about Hay Street. Yeah. Yes. This one, Hay Street, is right down here. <coughs> And that's, that, that was the entertainment area. <coughs> you can see that this is right across from, from uh, Capitol Hill on the other side. So it, they, were, they were using land from down here near the water all the way up uh, to the upper end of the campus. Now let's go back to uh, the uh, one of Pay Streak Entertainment area. Next one. There. This one, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, here, here are two, two of the the buildings that were built. The first one <coughs> is the upside down <coughs> building. You can see this looks like uh, the roof area. Yeah. You can see the steps coming oh, up yeah. to it up on top. So it was built just as a, an attraction that uh, was a, a little odd for for people to come in and. Uh, I don't know what all went on inside, but there were a, a lot of other uh, things that could. This building is a piano building. Can you see it? Yeah. Here's the top of the piano. You come down here, you can see where the keys would be. <laughs> so it, it was, again, okay. A couple of uh, creative uh, buildings that were a part of uh, what uh, was going on at the exposition. Now, let's just leave this one up uh, for a bit. Okay. There were a lot of other things that went on at the Alaska Yukon Pacific uh, Exposition. <coughs> First, there was an automobile race across the country. It started in New York City 
at the New York City Hall. Uh, in those days, the, the roads were uh, just worse than poor. In some cases, they were just downright hard to find. But six cars started. One, uh, and they started at 1 p.m. on June 1st. One of the cars dropped out in Kansas City. Two in Wyoming. Uh, the Ford number two won the, the contest when it drove through the main gate of the exposition at almost exactly one o'clock uh, on uh, June 23rd. Now from the 1st to the 23rd, all the way across the country in that day in those cars, it's a rather remarkable accomplishment considering the difficulties that they faced. How'd they cross the Cascades? <laughs> and the Rockies. Yeah, Cascades. They're, they're probably uh, had roads through the Cascades. I remember my mother talking about coming across the Cascades into Oregon by horse and buggy across a, uh, a small road through the, the uh, mountains. So it, it's possible that that's how they did it. I don't know. How many drivers did they have in a car? I, I don't know that. I assume that there was one in each car. Probably at least two. At least two, you think? Might make more sense. Yeah. Okay, during the exposition, they had some athletic events as well. Uh, in the stadium, uh, which was in existence, uh, uh, not, not the football stadium we now have, but a, another area that was uh, set aside for athletic events, uh, was an AAU outdoor track meet in August. In the half mile race, the pride of the East Harry Gissing from New York City was entered with others, including a tall, skinny athlete from Seattle. In the race, the local runner took off very fast. Gissing could never catch him. He was literally run off his feet. The Seattle runner walked off the track while Gissing had to be carried away. <laughs> The local man had won in the remarkable time of 1 minute 55 and 1 fifth seconds against a strong wind. Well, who was that man from Seattle? It was Clarence Heck Edmondson, <laughs> after whom the University Fieldhouse is named, and who successfully coached the UW track team and the basketball teams for many years. <laughs> So now the important part of all of this, as far as what happened to the university district, having all of the uh, buildings, yeah. yes, you can see you can see the buildings on here. Several of, of them oh, well, yeah. are all up here. Mm -hmm. There are other things. This, this would have been closer down to the water, but uh, when. When the fair was over, there were 20 buildings left to the University of Washington. Three of them were of a permanent construction, and those, uh, those became known as the Meany Hall, Bagley Hall, and Engineering Halls, and also the university uh, acquired this park-like campus that uh, allowed them uh, to uh, continue to develop, but in an organized way. Most noticeable of what remains of the fair today is perhaps the Rainier Vista, containing the Drumheller Fountain and the Rose Gardens. The Fine Arts Building, later called Bagley Hall, became known as the Architecture Building. In, uh, it, it 
An interesting uh, remnant is that the women's building that was originally intended as a temporary structure has been remodeled to become the Women's Information Center. We still have the statue of George Washington gazing from one end of the square opposite Susalo Library. And also the statue of Edvard Grieg poses quietly in a garden-like setting, setting between Susalo Library and Thompson Hall. That was established uh, because of, of the, uh, uh, I think it was the Norwegian uh, uh, group that wanted to have the building or the, uh, the statue uh, in his honor. The dairy barn remains as the plant operations <coughs> annex four, and the Michigan Club building exists as the physical plant office building. Some of you might remember the College Inn. How many of you ever went to the College Inn? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Great place to eat. It was also a uh, uh, kind of a bed and breakfast situation at various times during the year. It was in operation uh, during uh, the exposition, uh, but then it, it went out of business, back in business. It still uh, exists, uh, 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 has been uh, uh, a favorite of many people. Now, when the first decade of the 1900s ended, that is in 1910, the enrollment at the university had increased by 1,586 students from 16, four, uh, 614 to 2,200. So it was gaining. Oh, you're ahead of me. But that's exactly where I want to be. Okay. <laughs> This was, a, again, in this natural amphitheater that's over where Pedelford Hall would be today. Uh, this, this was held in 1910, honoring uh, President Theodore Roosevelt. And you can see that there was quite a crowd that uh, came out to uh, uh, hear him. So that, that's uh, two presidents that visited the University of Washington. Uh, within a year, uh, we had, if we look, look at the next page, uh, so this could give you some information about the size of things that occurred at the exposition. We had 250 acres of land that were committed to the AYP. If you compared that with the Century 21 Seattle World's Fair, they would have uh, had 74 acres. The different countries participating, 26 here, 20 over there. Total attendance, we had 3,740 people. 3,740,551. They had a larger amount, but notice that they uh, were there for 124 <coughs> days, and the AYP was only 138 days. Uh, maybe the more interesting thing is the last one. <laughs> because of the, the uh, regulations about the University of Washington in the early days, you couldn't have uh, alcohol closer than, I think it was originally two miles away. Uh, and uh, so that, that held. Where, is that? Where is that instituted? Do you know? Is that two miles, that limit, yeah. the alcohol limit? Yeah. When was that instituted? Oh, probably from right well, from the beginning. Yeah, I think right from the beginning. I, I thought it was maybe about 1909. <laughs> I know there were blue laws passed in 1909, other ones, we'll, about we'll, Sunday and so forth. We'll check it out. Yeah. Well, the reason I thought I would use this as the second major uh, influence on uh, the development of the university district is because uh, uh, not only had the university been recognized, but it had millions of people who came by the site. 
They had a number of buildings that were built that added to the campus. Uh, there was interest nationally in what was going on out here. And it was presented in such a positive way that I think it was a, a, a major factor in getting the recognition that the university uh, could use. Now I want to shift to an, another major factor, and we can we can uh, walk through it a little more quickly. You recall last last time I showed you this slide, and if you were over here in Ballard. You can see the black dots, and these are the, the places where people are living. But if you look at the, the uh, University of Washington, there, there isn't much in here. That's There's, the Union Bay. That's because it's water. <laughs> yes, well, I, I'm going to speak on that. Uh, but here you can see the other portions, uh, the Fremont. Latona would be more our area. Ravenna is up here. And uh, uh, this, this would be the Laurelhurst area out here, and Sandpoint, so on. But the thing that was important here is that if you look at where Lake Washington is, <coughs> as I pointed out last time, yeah. it, it goes all the way up in here. Mm -hmm. And if you, you look at Union Bay, it's, it's over on this side. So that there is an area between these, just below the University of Washington, that is, uh, this is the isthmus between the, the two. So I want to talk a bit about the development of the Lake Washington Ship Canal. Can we go to the next slide, please? Do you want to picture one? Oh, this, is, this will work right here okay. for the time being. In the, I'm, I'm going to read this. And can you read it well enough from there? Yeah. No. Uh, the, the important thing is that uh, back in 1853, Major General George B. McClellan, then a captain in the Army Engineers, reported to Jefferson Davis, the U.S. Secretary of War, that he thought that a canal connecting Lake Washington and Puget Sound would create the finest naval resort in the world. <laughs> in 1854, Thomas Mercer at a picnic with some of the early settlers spoke about the same thing. And uh, as it turned out, the canal, uh, when it was, was uh, eventually uh, completed, uh, would give, gave access to salt water that made many other things possible in the university district. Uh, special businesses could uh, receive their uh, merchandise uh, via the water. Uh, there were uh, many things that resulted from this. They point out uh, uh, the, the influence uh, of uh, 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 Lauren Donaldson, who uh, was at the fisheries uh, uh, at school at the university. Uh, as many of you know, uh, they used to have a little pond that uh, they would uh, probably still do, where a big salmon uh, come back up uh, through the, the canal and uh, come right into the pond, right beside the fisheries department. Uh, and uh, you, you can get there in the fall when they are harvesting these and they'll, they'll take a, a pickup full of salmon uh, out of this that they have uh, uh, brought back. And uh, of course they put the, the chips in them so that they know uh, uh, that they are ones that had returned, that had originally been started there and so on. So his, his work uh, and the entire fishery school, they used to have their boat uh, uh, right outside of the fisheries uh, uh, department. And uh, if they went out to do some studying in the Pacific, uh, they could uh, start from there and go out and uh, uh, do the research that they were going to do. Well, let's, let's look at the next slide. <coughs> this is a slide that is uh, 
about, here's Lake Washington all over here. You can see Mercer Island in here. Notice up here that there is this connection. That's the way Lake Washington was before we had the ship canal. Hmm. Notice that this is Lake Union. And there is this isthmus in between that would have to be dealt with if they were going to connect these two. Similarly, if you wanted to connect Lake Union, you, you would have to choose a way that you were going to connect Lake Washington all the way to Puget Sound. So the six routes that were uh, reported, four of them involved the Interlake uh, Canal at, uh, at Mont Lake. Uh, two of them would have a, a, a canal dug at, to, into Elliott Bay from the south end of Lake Union. Another one would have gone down here and then uh, cut across to Smith Bay. And one went down through here and all the way down to, uh, uh, through Ballard to uh, the Shilshaw Bay, through Salmon Bay to Shilshaw Bay. Now they had two other routes that were possible and, and discussed originally. One was from Lake Union at this point and uh, uh, this would have gone uh, through uh, uh, Be Beacon. Beacon Hill uh, and uh, would get into Elliott Bay that way, but it would have to be cut through the Beacon Hill area. The last one was to take the Black River that used to drain out of Lake Washington to the Duwamish River and then get back this way. Well, they discussed all of the possible options and they decided that the, the winner is the, the one that would have taken them right down here to Shilshaw Bay. <clears throat> so let's, let's think about this a minute. The Washington shoreline, this is what it would have been like prior to the constrict, construction of the, the uh, ship canal. And look at the next one. This is the Mont Lake area. And you're looking over here to, toward the other side. You can see where 23rd Street or something would go up there. But uh, this area is just flat land in the main. There was a little hill in here that had to be dealt with, but uh, uh, that was what had to be dealt with. There was an interesting comment was that uh, from Lake Union uh, to Lake Washington, uh, people thought that it would be a good idea to, to have a waterway between them. And in 1860, Harvey Pike, he attempted to dig a canal through Mont Lake by hand. <laughs> of course, that was just too big a job for such an effort, but I'm impressed that he had the courage to get out and try it. Now, there was an, another group of people that got together and developed the log canal. This canal had to go approximately 1,900 feet, and it had to be dug into this area. Uh, and wide enough, you, you can see that, uh, that this one, you've got logs that are floating down it. But uh, it was completed in 1883, and uh, the ship canal wasn't completed until 1917. So for a long time, the only way that uh, the uh, uh, lumbermen or the, 
the uh, logging companies uh, had to get their logs from the upper end of uh, Lake Washington would be to come down and shoot them through here so that they would be in Lake Union and either. Did that lower the lake levels or did that not? No, it did not. They had, they had a uh, system at the top that blocked the, the water from lowering down. So the log canal provided a good service and uh, was useful for a good many years. Uh, these are the guillotine locks that would be at the north uh, or at the east end of the log canal. And uh, so they could allow water to flow through for a period of time and then they could lock it out so that it stayed up there. So let's look at the next one. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, where the ship canal was being dug. And the, uh, the contractor for this, uh, C.J. Erickson, uh, he moved heavy equipment into the Montlake Cut, uh, as the canal is, uh, area is called, uh, in September of 1909. This was while the adjacent land, uh, the adjacent land, the Alaska-Yukon Pacific Exposition was still in, in uh, <laughs> progress. So the, the Montlake uh, cut, he decided that they should uh, put the, the uh, canal uh, about 500 feet north of where the log canal had been. Uh, so that uh, the reason for this is that it, it would uh, make it possible for large ships not to have to make a, a, a sharp turn when they got down to enter Lake Union. So uh, you can imagine what the homeowners along, <laughs> uh, along Lake Washington would have felt when they suddenly realized that Lake Washington, which was eight and a half feet higher than Lake Union, they were going to have to do something that could make them at the same level. So what did they do? They have to lower the level of Lake Washington by eight and a half feet. <clears throat> now, what's that going to do to your property if you've got lakefront property? <laughs> it may give you a lot more. <laughs> it, it, it certainly well, it could cause problems from that. Uh, the, the other was if you looked at that little area that uh, was... Uh, on the, on the map that we looked at that, that uh, showed where the water came in uh, toward uh, uh, this the monthly cut. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. this yeah. little part. Mm -hmm. okay. If you lowered this by eight and a half feet, much of that is going to be gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that area was drained as well. And if you lowered it by eight and a half feet, that opened up a lot of land up there in the direction of Ravenna. And uh, so that got uh, used as a garbage dump for a while. Then it got to be filled over so that uh, that land is now uh, where some of our uh, baseball field and other things uh, now exist down in that uh, region. But uh, it was a remarkable uh, thing to have this lower. Yes. Well, you, you can imagine as well that the residents along the shore were, they feared that there was going to be a consequence of an immediate lowering of the lake. So legal action was taken and a court order was issued to prevent the dynamiting of the Lake Washington dike. <clears throat> The contractor, however, prevented the order from being enforced. The dike was blasted at 4 p.m. on October 26, 1910, and the debate was over. <laughs> Allowing water to flow from Lake Washington through the canal to Lake Union. Now let's just, this is just to show you that in 1908, this is Laurel Hurst in the background, uh, 
This is our women's uh, rowing team. So that they were active in those days in Lake Washington, even as they, they would be today. Look at the next one. These are the gates that were uh, to hold the water uh, back uh, on, on Lake Washington. So when the canal was excavated, they were used to just gradually lower the, the uh, level of the lake. Lowering it, once they could uh, uh, have access through uh, Lake Union and on uh, to uh, Puget Sound, it took them three, three months to lower the level of the lake. Huh. You can imagine how much water had to be lowered <laughs> yeah. to get it down eight and a half feet. This, this was a remarkable uh, a factor that uh, changed the nature of the university district in terms of, of what was on the water and not. And uh, so uh, if we look then from the locks there to the exploding of the uh, uh, dike separating Lake Washington and the ship, ship canal, and then if we look at the coffer dam that was on the western end of the Mont Lake Cut. Uh -huh. Well, this, this, this is, there's one more. That, I want to see the one about this. One, there, there we are. Yeah. Uh, this one had to be dealt with as well. Uh, <laughs> you can see these people out there with shovels and so on. Oh, yeah. They were out there going to, to, to just get water flowing from Lake Union on down toward Puget Sound. They were idiots. They were standing <laughs> out here, and things started flowing away very quickly. And uh, they, if they weren't able to run back on either side, they had to wash down uh, with all of the rest of the debris that uh, went down. So it, it, the person who was in charge of the event was sitting down watching it and just scratching his head into why would anybody get out there and do that? <laughs> Let's look at the the next picture. There it is. Okay, this, this is the uh, Hiram Crittenden locks down, what we call them the Ballard locks. Yeah. Uh, and this is what they looked like when they were being built. This is where the ships are going to be flowing through here, but this is what it no. looked like. As, ah. So obviously we had to do the same kind of dig from Lake Union down to Puget Sound that we did from Lake Washington uh, to, to Lake Union. Now once the, you, know, you can see the locks there now, uh, and it, this is what it, would, it looked like in 1917, after this has all been completed. And uh, now then, we have this nice waterway that comes on up uh, from Puget Sound. <clears throat> now the old Latona Bridge that you had asked about had to be remodeled before the opening of the ship canal. The old bridge was a roadway built on pilings with shorthand operated span in the middle. In 1916, the bridge was improved by the installation of a movable span of 79 feet. The change was required to enable the large ships to have access to the Mont Lake Cut and Lake Washington. The Latona Bridge continued to serve the district until the University Bridge was built in 1919. So that's, that's the answer to your question, Judy. Now let's look at the next one. Okay. This is the, when the Montlake Bridge opened in 1925. By 1926, this was the largest ship that had gone through the canal. I think that's just a remarkable achievement to have opened up this waterway that gave access. And, and for many years, the, the, the government, the U.S. government, had ships located uh, out uh, uh, near Magnuson Park. Uh, and uh, uh, the fisheries department uh, of the U.S. had their boats there. They, they would take them out to uh, do studies of, of fish runs and so on. But that, but that was uh, rather remarkable. 
I have three three quick pictures here that I'd like to show you, and then we we'll take any comments or questions. Uh, the Navy. Yes, we'll go to the Navy. One of the things that happened: the U.S. government had had become very familiar with the University of Washington, and uh, when World War II started, I said or World War One started, uh, they housed a, a bunch of the trainees uh, uh, at uh, the campus. And you can see uh, the uh, tents that they used. Uh, the area that they used would be in the next picture. Uh, and the final picture is of uh, uh, some of them on campus. <laughs> with, with the uh, Denny Hall in the background. But, uh, it, uh, I think it started a, an interesting relationship between the U.S. government and uh, the University of Washington. And I think in many ways uh, the reputation of, of the university and what, what was possible here were influenced by these three three different events that uh, we've talked about this morning. Mm -hmm. So that's about all I have. But I've got, there's one other picture if you want to show this one. Mm -hmm. these, you know, these you can hardly see. These are the bell chimes that the, the uh, that were put in the bell tower. They were nice. delivered about the same time. Comments? Okay, Lowell's, Lowell's hand went up first. Here I come. So you talked about the shoreline on Lake Washington when the water went down eight feet. What happened to Lake Union? It stayed at the same level. Where did the water from Lake Washington go then? Down. Wow. <laughs> it just it so it, there was, was it was always uh, it had to be lowered by the eight feet as as you pour, put that into Lake Union and then out of Lake Union and into uh, Puget Sound. Oh, so Lake Union opened into the Sound before that ship canal was built. In. Yes. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Just a point of interest, uh, while you've got the slide of the bells on there, I was here as a student when the bell tower burned down. Yes. And I it was it. quite a sight. And uh, I think there was a blind guy that uh, climbed the tower every day to uh, play some songs on the bells, but it was all mechanical, and so the rhythm was kind of jerky. <laughs> yeah. His name was Mr. Bailey, and I could hear them from my house where I grew up. Very good. Is that by the observatory? Uh, let's see. I think, okay, Lester? Lester here. <clears throat> Who acquired all that dry land that was created? <laughs> I, I don't know how to answer that. I'm sure that the owners of the land leading to the lake probably had it uh, given to them, uh, but I, I, I think the other uh, land, like uh, up, uh, oh, to, where the, the cut had, had uh, lured the land in that little area at the en entry from Lake Washington in, into the uh, ship canal. Uh, the, that, and much of it went to the university, I think. But, but there's a heck of a lot more land than that. Oh, yes. All the way around Lake Washington. <laughs> it went all the way up. The swampy part went all the way up to where University Village yeah. is now. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, there was the landfill. <laughs> yeah. Henry has heard of it. Who? Henry. Oh, Henry, okay. Yeah, I was going to talk about the landfill south of the where University Village across 45th Street. It was all landfill and it stank. It yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I remember that. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I had a, um, a Union Bay Village with lots of married student housing. I had an aunt and uncle and a couple of cousins living there. They were right, right next to it. And we were maybe about a quarter mile away. But that landfill, story about that landfill, there was Calvary Cemetery uh, right um, up the hill to the east. In the morning, a guy would come out into the cemetery and fire some blanks to wake up all the seagulls who'd gone to the cemetery to sleep. And they flew in great crowds right over my house down to the landfill where they spent the day. So that was a morning ritual. <laughs> Back to the stink. I used to play flag football on some of the recent fill, yep. and it was still pretty stinky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it took a while. Well, it was still off gassing. That's why they have the pipes to pull the methane. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, next week there's part three. More about the landfill, maybe? <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll talk more uh, next week about the university district itself and uh, some of the buildings that went in there and, uh, and the changes that that uh, made for the whole uh, district. Yeah. Well, we'll thanks. bring you up maybe to the Second World War and then I'll leave uh, the time from then on forward for somebody else to trace. Yes, okay. Well, we'll look forward to that. These, these are great historical photos, aren't they? Um, thanks again. Thanks again, Fred. We'll look forward to the next week.